Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming today. Hope you've been enjoying the conference. My name is Ryan Gross, and I'm here to take you through some thoughts that have been on my mind for the better part of a year now. By the time we're done with this talk, I'm, I'm really hoping that you'll be about as excited about it as I am. Make sure you're in the right place. During this session, here's the questions that we'll answer together today. Go over the cloud data lake house pattern, although there's plenty of people who can tell you about that, and so try to do it in a minute or less. And then focus in on the problems that lake houses are really good at solving, and some of those that are really and you know, I'm noticing it's going to be hard for us to solve with a lake house. I'm going to introduce this concept of fog computing and how it might help solve some of those harder problems. And then go into the complexities and trade-offs that you'll be taking on if you try to go build a fog data platform. And eventually walk you through a guide for how you can get started, taking into account some of the ways to manage those complexities. Along the way, hoping to answer your questions. And so please send those into the Q&A, and I will try to get them answered ASAP. So lake house in one minute. Essentially, the, the lake house term came about by the cloud data providers taking advantage of the enterprise scramble onto the cloud for these massive data sets that are now available in nearly every industry. And they really built messaging more so than technology around how you take the best elements of a data lake platform on the cloud that has separation of compute and storage and enables you to store arbitrary data and a data warehouse platform that has lots of structure, very fast query times, and provides that SQL interface, SQL interface that everybody's used to. So that's really the data lake house in a nutshell. It's still a centralized platform on the cloud and it leverages cloud scaling capabilities based on the separation of storage and compute to enable you to scale up to massive data sets. If you're looking to learn more about lake houses, there's actually two sessions in this track, both A201 and A205, that will give you more information on the pattern and how to implement it on different technology stacks. Like I mentioned before, what we're interested in this talk is a little bit around what are lake houses good at? Well, ultimately, they are underpinning the value of AI and analytics. And so one of the best ways for us to determine what they're good at is to go look at some of the AI and analytics use cases that are out there. And the best place that I've found to get those is a study from the McKinsey Global Institute where the headline was that AI will generate $3.5 trillion in annual economic value by next year. The nice thing about that McKinsey study, which you can read in the article, Notes from the AI Frontier, and I, I do highly recommend this to anybody who's interested in the space and understanding how businesses are really putting to use AI to kind of extract value from their data. I really like this particular one because it was based on 400 use cases and they shared a lot of their data. So we're able to go analyze that data, right? We can pull it up in Excel or our tool of choice here and understand all of those different use cases. So let's dive a little bit deeper. Now, Data lake house architectures are definitely a best fit for those cold use cases, things that are historical analysis, looking at a few of them here, diagnosing diseases, predicting the lifetime value of a customer, optimizing CapEx investments. These are things that realize value over a long period of time. Diving into the remainder of the use cases in the, the cold, long historical analysis category, we can use a word cloud to visualize a little bit of the, the themes that are within the, these use cases. So obviously when you use a word cloud, you end up with a few large words that are really obvious. So let's pull those out and then take a look at what we're really talking about here. So we are optimizing and by predicting new data trends. And those data trends are around markets or marketing products. And then a lot of things where you might reduce costs to spend over time. So other things that come out in, in the next layer here are targeting of individual messages or uh, targeting of advertising, most likely discovery of new drugs, of new crops, so on. So these are really high value use cases. And a lot of organizations are already going after these types of things on Lake House platforms. And again, there's a whole track here on realizing value where you can get some uh, case studies from companies who are actually doing this during Data Summit Connect. Next step down here are warm use cases. So rather than being long historical value realization, these are ones where value is realized in that 
you know, a minute to an hour of timeline from when the data arrives to when a prediction and, and action needs to be taken. Again, some of the highest impact ones here would be optimizing pricing for the logistics industry, and, you know, including airlines or proactive maintenance type operations on heavy equipment that is turning out a ton of value. So think oil rigs or mining equipment or factory assembly lines. Digging into the word cloud for these, you see that at the top level, you're looking to predict and recommend optimal solutions. Again, obviously data-based solutions. And underneath of that, you're trying to predict failure or recommend individual so solutions for specific people or uh, specific B2B customers. Those things might be focused on predicting equipment failure. A lot of it is trying to do things proactively rather than reactively. So these streaming use cases are, or sorry, warm use cases are what I would consider streaming use cases. And there are also a lot of tools that have been built within the lake house paradigm to enable streaming. In fact, the Databricks Delta uh, tool that was really one of the first times that the lake house term started getting used was specifically built to enable Spark structured streaming and Spark batch to coexist on the same underlying data sets in the data lake. Other tools in this space would be things like Apache Flink, which enable uh, real-time in-memory processing of lots of streaming data. And then from the major cloud providers, you have Amazon Kinesis, uh, Azure Event Hubs, and the whole analytics stacks that go with those, as well as the whole Confluent ecosystem that's been built up around Kafka, the message broking, broker tool as a core, a core component. So these warm use cases can be done in a lake house architecture using those streaming tools. Uh, I myself have been involved in building some of these platforms. The one thing I will say though, is that it, it tends to be significantly more expensive and more complex to build the streaming application and to run it. I'd say uh, based on my experience, like five times as expensive to build and five times as expensive to run a platform that's running streaming versus batch. And, and you'll start to hear things like, you know, the Lambda architecture, the Kappa architecture for um, leveraging batch pooling to make up for some of the deficiencies in the streaming tooling. Next set of use cases are pop use cases. So these are those that are really needing that answer right away in order to realize the value. So the top two here are a little bit of a special case. So personalized advertising, well, that data is already on the cloud and may be able to stream into a lake house architecture already. And in fact, this is probably one of the most mature areas for existing platforms. And the second one here is self-driving cars, which is basically an industry on its own and has developed its own set of techniques that actually I think a lot of the, the remainder of the data space is, is learning from. But moving on from there, you have things like customizing growing based on real-time data or optimizing pricing in real time. Those types of real-time use cases. So looking at the word cloud, the big words are real-time data-based optimization, process improvement, individualization, and then from there, you can see a ton of different potential um, uses of that, right? Customers, call centers, processing, sorting. Um, so a lot of variety here where the theme is definitely real time. So let's take a look at a specific real time example just to show what it would look like to build one of these types of applications on a lake house architecture. And we're going to use the canonical industrial IoT industry 4.0 use case. So in this case, you're looking at uh, auto manufacturing plant. And let's assume that in that auto plant, there are cameras capturing images of the product for quality control. Those are going to be sent through real-time computer vision analysis to determine if a part is bad and automatically route the bad part off of the assembly line for further inspection. Additionally, all the machines are going to be instrumented with vibration and acoustic sensors, capturing high frequency data so that you can determine if there's a risk of a machine outage or you know, something abnormal going on with one of your machines. If you do need to take a machine out of service, it's going to be a really high cost because you stop the line for the time until it's put back into service. And to make up for that, the plant manager can try to switch capacity onto a different line in the same plant. 
Now, in a typical auto OEM scenario, you'd probably have 30 factories like this. Each one has four to five lines producing different vehicles or you know, increasing volume of the same vehicle. And each line is going to have 10 to 30 large machines and you know, then a lot of smaller machines as well. Those machines are likely purchased over time and will be heterogeneous, meaning they're not all going to be exactly the same thing. So you can't just assume the same exact solution for each one of them. And finally, you have a global logistics team that's going to need to understand the total output of the factories such that they can manage supply and demand with the dealer network getting the right amount of vehicles to fill orders. So in this type of solution, you have some, you know, warm use cases in global logistics, but you have a lot of these hot use cases in uh, predictive maintenance and uh, camera, real-time computer vision. So let's take a look at what that looks like on your lake house architecture that we saw before. First off, you're going to have lots of image data and or image slash video data, and that data is not small. So 200 megabit per second, if you add all up all of the different camera sensors that might be in play making 10,000 computer vision inferences per second across all of your assembly lines. So that all that's gonna have to flow all the way from all these different factories up to the cloud alongside the 50 megabit per second high frequency sensor data. It may not really be all that differentiated over time per machine. In order to make predictions on machine um, health, you also have to window the data streams across each of those machines in order to uh, to understand what's been happening over time. Then you may have a lot of predictive maintenance in inferences to make, and those need to get back out to the individual factories quickly. Now, this arrow here back to the factory is not really the way that that gets out there. In actuality, it goes out by moving forward to the data warehouse and out through pools that have been built. But along the way, you're not just streaming this stuff through because you, you want to capture it for the future. So you may have petabytes of raw data, terabytes of inference results, something in the 100 gigabyte range of predictive maintenance results along with the associated input features so that you can understand that model performance. But then as you build the applications, you, uh, you, know, you do aggregations up to the assembly line and factory level, which brings you down to like one gigabyte of data such that the global logistics team can run their analysis. And then on the plant side, you actually end up filtering the data back down to only one plant or only one assembly line. There's only the, you know, megabytes of data going out through your visualization report to the plant managers so they can do that uh, diversion of capacity to different lines or small packets of data going to machine operators telling them about what to do with specific machines. So you've taken lots of small data across a lot of different machines, centralized it into petabytes of data, and then decentralized it back to where it came from with the use cases at the end, the actual small megabytes of data going back. And that's really inefficient. So as you look at it, these hot use cases, one, they're doing all of this, sending it all the way to the cloud and back in the seconds or minutes it would take in order to make sure that you're not putting that bad, bad quality products down the line is really hard to manage in the first place. And second, it's going to be really costly to build this type of system. So as we break down the use cases and assign the value to add up to that 3.5 trillion, the cold side represents uh, you know, a little less than half, right? 1.5 trillion, certainly not chump change, and there's a lot that can be gained. And that's why conferences like this are, are helping to diffuse that lake house technology as well as you know, the other trillion dollars that are tied up in these warm use cases that, that certainly can be done, albeit more expensively, on the streaming versions of Lake House solutions. It's this last trillion that's going to be really hard for people to pull off without building custom specialized solutions. So really, I don't really, I don't think that we're gonna get that 3.5 trillion in 2022 now. Granted, that prediction was made in 2018, so they, they probably didn't predict some of the other things that have happened in between, like a global pandemic. But in my estimation, we're not really even going to get there by 2025 at the current rate, unless we start to really evolve our data platforms such that we can go after those hot use cases and more easily tackle those warm use cases as well. So how are we going to manage 
and build the platforms that enable us to tackle hot and warm use cases. But I think one of the key things that's going to help is the concept of fog computing. This is something that's been around since 2014 when Cisco coined the term, but has really evolved over the last two years or so, and almost even gotten a new term, right? Because of the way it's evolving, a lot of people are starting to call this distributed cloud computing. But I like the term fog. It's a good visualization that helps you understand that really what you're talking about is bringing the cloud to the ground. That's what fog is. It's just a cloud that's sitting on the ground. And in this case, when we say the ground, we really mean out to the edge. So breaking down fog computing will help us understand how it's going to help us solve these problems. So when you started out with these industrial IoT applications, they were really just new versions of client server applications from the 1990s. You had internet connected devices, connected to cloud IoT data hubs, and there's a cloud IoT device control system that pushes commands or software updates back out to the devices. Cloud computing introduced the concept of the edge not only connected back to the proper cloud, but to something a little closer. In the fog, you may actually still be on-prem in the same location. So in the factory, you might set up a uh, server or a gateway that's going to be able to have really low latency connection and a little bit more compute power than these low power IoT devices. And then that fog computing is gonna be connected back into the cloud side of things such that it can get updates and send data back and forth. The cloud side stayed exactly the same. You still send your data through a hub and end up pushing it into a cloud data lake for a lake house platform. But that's really amorphous. The, the fog layer here doesn't really tell you too much about how you should architect for it. And it really doesn't tell you how it helps to solve the problems you're looking at. Moving forward, starting maybe three years ago, but really becoming realized over the last couple of years, there, there's been more of an evolution of the layers in a fog computing hierarchy. So you still have the edge. The IoT connected devices in most industrial scenarios are now running through a specific IoT gateway. The exception to this being mobile, so equipment that's in the field or equipment that is uh, driving around like a car. And those gateways have lots of capabilities to run compute, even things like AIML inference directly on the device. Next layer out from there, in the, the on-prem version of fog computing, you have what I'll call local hybrid cloud. These are things like AWS outposts, Azure Stack, or um, IBM's OpenShift pooling that can be installed directly in the factory, runs a whole server rack, and actually runs a small subset of the cloud managed services. Specifically, going to be pretty good at running Kubernetes clusters, allowing Docker deployments, or potentially the serverless technology from the specific cloud provider that you're talking to. It also has a locally deployed version of the cloud control hub. Then you look at scale here, the edge is a little bit more of the you know, single chip sensors up to maybe a small uh, system on a chip solution, but limited memory, limited bandwidth, custom protocols, a little harder to work with. So most IoT applications or uh, fog data applications are going to treat these as kind of the dumb data forwarders. Potentially they might take some actions as well, you know, turning on a light or running a switch. Gateways come in many shapes, sizes, flavors, operating systems, but ultimately they have the common characteristic of being the first layer where the cloud providers can give you a unified interface. Uh, not every gateway is going to fit that bill, but each of them have their own programs, AWS Greengrass and Azure IoT Edge, um, that enable you to deploy things to these gateways using the same programming model that you're used to running on the cloud. In fact, you can actually test a lot of the solutions on a full cloud data center. You're still going to be looking at like, you know, laptop-like performance at this stage. And then once you get to that edge hybrid cloud, you're able to get a full rack, meaning you can really do things like auto scaling or having uh, high provision capacity for complex use cases. Ones like all of those proactive maintenance ones we were talking about before. Next layer out is this concept of a nearby local cloud zone. So going back, I mentioned gateways and edge hybrid cloud are usually the way that you connect in 
explain those mobile scenarios where your you know equipment machinery appliance here is actually a car or a tractor in a field or a mine truck in a mine you might not be able to have a, you know a fixed gateway or server rack nearby but what we do have now is 5g and fiber networking that can give you really really low latency to a data center that might actually be directly in the 5g network hub or uh, you know, within one hop from your location via fiber connection. And that's this concept of a local cloud zone. So this is fully managed. It's you know, the building all the way up through the infrastructure is managed by a cloud provider. And it's going to provide a lot larger subset of the managed cloud services so that you can start to do um, even up to the some of the API services, you know, Google's Cloud Vision or Amazon's Comprehend, uh, Cortana Suite stuff from Microsoft can run here and be a part of your applications while still being in that you know, 10 millisecond latency from the edge, not just 10 millisecond latency from the servers on the cloud. Usually those cloud zones are also able to run the control plane of the IoT service as well. So the uh, IoT core solution, the Watson solution from IBM can be 10 milliseconds away so that you can provision devices and, and manage things as if you were on-prem. So, at this point, you're now talking about high-speed networking, full server rooms, full of uh, machines available using the same interfaces, EC2 type interface on Amazon, for example, that you're used to interacting with on the cloud, including auto scaling and all of the, the niceties that you come to expect. Deployment models really all the way out to the gateways would use DevOps techniques in order to actually deploy these things. And then you're familiar with the full hyperscale cloud data center that is still part of the solution and is also connected in via, well, I guess really it says 5G or fiber. This is connected into the local cloud zones via um, 5G. It's pretty expensive. You can get a fiber connection direct to the cloud from all of these external locations using tools like Express Route on Azure or AWS um, Direct Connect. But that's a really expensive proposition when you're thinking about 30 different factories you're connecting in. And a lot of those likely aren't right next to existing high-speed fiber back. So the modern VOG architecture, they're providing many different layers. It becomes a little bit more clear how to architect your applications to fit components into those different layers. Additionally, the cloud providers have built up the capabilities to have that unified programming model all the way from the cloud back to the gateways and even starting to bleed into the edge devices. So looking forward, the VOG computing and distributed cloud ecosystem is going to continue to evolve, but it's already to the point where from every major cloud provider at every layer of the fog hierarchy, there is a solution being built at the infrastructure layer. So this is not how do you build your specific applications, but this is how do you build a deployment mechanism so that you can get those applications deployed onto fog computing. And that I think is gonna be one of the big accelerators along with the 5G networking that I talked about before for those, uh, those mobile -like use cases that enables fog computing to help us solve those hot and warm use cases by taking some of the same applications that we were centralizing and decentralizing them back out. That's where that distributed cloud um, term is coming from. So given that a lot of these services have existed for a little while, right? Many of them for three or more years, why aren't we seeing lots of presentations at Data Summit Connect on how people are using distributed cloud to solve these hot and warm use cases? Well, I think it really gets to a lot of the complexities to building this. The infrastructure side of things is becoming more and more solved. But what's not really there right now is the frameworks, models, best practices that'll help you successfully architect these types of applications. Unlike the lake house paradigm, which is reaching maturity and really well understood at this point, distributed cloud is still in that forming stage in terms of how we should build these applications. So that's what I want to focus a lot of our time on today is how do you solve for the challenges and see through the fog? So four main challenges that we want to address, in addition to just the complexities of building high quality data products and data platforms, the specific to fog challenges are first, adding questions on where you should deploy each of the calculations that are required in order to realize a data product from the raw data into your many layers of fog hierarchy. And then how do you manage that going forward? 
two is how do you test it? So usually on the cloud with DevOps these days, we have multiple environments, infrastructure as code, manage everything and make sure that what we're deploying into production is exactly what was tested beforehand and feel pretty good about our confidence. The whole concept of data ops that I've given a lot of talks on in the past helps solve for the challenges of data pipelines in that scenario. And the challenge there is that, you know, it's going to be hard to get an exact replica of that gateway or of the many distributed gateways. So you may need to invest quite a bit in the testing infrastructure. Third, you have a system that is going to have lots of lower powered devices out at the edge and distributed compute running on those. And that means that you aren't going to be able to have that assumption that all of the data is available every time you want to do any calculation. And that's just a different mindset that you need to take in order to build these up. And finally, the problems that you're solving in this space are just inherently more complex. The hot use cases are typically going to be harder than the cold use cases in general to build from an architectural perspective. Now, some of those cold use cases like diagnosing diseases are going to be very difficult to solve as well just due to the complexity of that type of problem. But the architecture for how you solve them isn't necessarily the challenge. It's more about getting the right data sets and um, the business knowledge or acumen in order to, to solve those specific types of problems. So in order to get into the right mindset for building these fog systems, we can start to think about the what I call the WUKIDS framework, wisdom down through the very base layer, which is stimuli. So stimuli are the things that are actually happening in the real world. And we don't measure all of them, but we now have the capability to build instrumentation and sensors and so forth to measure a lot more of these stimuli than we have in the past. When we do measure things, we end up observing events. Each event is something that happened at a specific time captured as an, an observation or measurement, right? Observation could be an image or a video frame or an audio file, or just you know, the number 10 in terms of the reading on a specific sensor. And so that last part though, the specific sensor or the camera that captured it or the person that keyed it into a, uh, an application are, it becomes the third part of an event. So an event can be thought of as a triplet of the observation, when it happened and how it was captured. We take those events and we combine them into an event stream and then run some processing on top of them to extract information, the behavior of a machine over time, the particular objects that are being seen in an image, whether the product that's a work in progress on an assembly line is defective or not, could be information that is extracted from a computer vision a model over a video frame. Those streams of information can be further processed and mapped back to what's actually happening in the real world. And by doing that, we take the information that's gathered and create knowledge about what's actually happening. That knowledge enables us to take actions. So that computer vision model that says, yes, this product is defective is going to need to be mapped back to which assembly line, which particular product along that assembly line so that we can take the action of further manual inspection and potentially scrapping that part before it goes out and becomes an unreliable product. Over time, the actions we take affect the other components of the system. They produce new stimuli that we measure as new data that we synthesize into new, new information and they give us new knowledge. That synthesis of what happens when we change things leads to understanding. Knowing impact of actions in a holistic way across multiple interacting data products. That's the next level up, that understanding. It's really hard for systems themselves to learn. But it's at the understanding level that we really start to see those optimizations and reductions and basically everything that we were talking about as we used real-time database solutions to optimize processes or individualize things in real time. So that is the challenge that we have in front of us. In order to actually build these types of systems though, we need some best practices. And so there are a number of solutions or techniques and technologies that we can apply to make building those types of systems that extract understanding from data measured over the many stimuli that are actually happening in the real world. Now there's a subset of these that are infrastructure focused that we will not be talking about today. Like I said, on the Lake House side, there are lots of great talks that you can go out to either from the cloud providers themselves about their distributed clouds or from uh, other partners that have helped build up that infrastructure layer solution. What we'll be focusing on here are six different techniques that will help 
architects to see through the fog, design the applications and the data pipelines distributed across the full infrastructure of an enterprise so that they can start to realize the value of fog computing applications. First one of these techniques is log-centric processing. So this is something that almost all streaming applications today rely on. It was really introduced by Apache Kafka and the team at LinkedIn that eventually became the team at Confluent. It really makes you think of the world as a series of time-ordered events that have happened as opposed to a current state data table. That allows you to work across a lot of different data producers at scale in a way that your data consumers can replay what has happened to understand the state of things and can take their own views of it based on what they need to do. You can look at the current state by continually reading over what happened and, and updating the current state in the consuming application. That can create a specific info stream of synthesized current, current state that gets passed along as well. The message broker tools that have been built up over time have developed a lot of patterns for how you manage this at scale. And that's really starting to get out into the distributed world just now. I mentioned there's not a lot of frameworks and best practices, and those that are in existence are relatively nascent. One that I would suggest looking at if you're building these types of distributed cloud applications would be Dapper, Distributed Application Runtime, an open source framework for Microsoft that actually runs on any cloud. You know, it runs on Azure, it also runs on AWS, GCP, Alibaba, any Kubernetes in implementation, and supports a whole lot of different programming models. But underlying it, the core services that Dapper provides to applications are discovery of the rest of the distributed network, the state management to actually keep that time-ordered event series on the device within whatever memory or local storage it has, the ability to publish and subscribe to event streams from other components of your distributed cloud data pipeline, and then actor models that enable you to process all of those events in a way where you don't have to manage the underlying multi-threading and, and complexities of that so you can process things efficiently. I think this is going to start to set up some of those programming paradigms and best practices at the application layer, similar to how the cloud providers have provided a unified infrastructure layer. Underlying this, most of the time, you have the Docker deployment mechanism that'll give you that uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment model on top of the new infrastructure. So that's the processing component of this. One of the key differences for data is that we also have to model the data itself so that we understand the, uh, both the metadata about the events that we're capturing, as well as the time, uh, or not the time, but the way that the different data interacts to form higher level data products. So to do that, let's go relook at our example application in the context of the modern cloud computing, or sorry, modern distributed cloud computing infrastructure. And we'll do that via visualizing our data as a directed acyclic graph, a DAG. So if you've used uh, Apache Airflow or tools like DBT, DAG should be a term that's familiar to you. But if not, it's really about representing downstream calculations as a product of upstream data sources. So in this case, we start with the sensors, the sensors are measuring those stimuli, you know, pictures or uh, vibrations or sounds. And those flow into our DAG and go into higher and higher level calculations about the maintenance, uh, the predictive maintenance model to telling us whether a machine might be at risk of downtime or product quality showing us whether we should be taking downtime because our, our quality levels are degrading to the point where it's worth it. We can then have rule-based calculations or other machine learning models running on top of that that help us make uh, determinations about machine uptime. And then by aggregating those machines that are on the same product line, we can start to understand production line uptime. That allows a uh, data product development team to understand, hey, here's all of the different things that are going to be built. And then zooming out across different factories, we can start to predict how much of each product we're going to be making such that we can run those global scale analyses. So you may have other systems data that's not just IoT feeding into these applications. And we'll get into how that might need to flow back and forth across the graph over time. Now, the next thing we need to understand is how 
to place those calculations on top of the cloud architecture. So to make it a little bit more real, I've used the AWS technology stack here, but you can imagine gateways, edge hybrid, uh, local cloud zones and full cloud zones as the main components here where each of the orange uh, edge devices at the bottom are, are the, the actual edge component of this. Now by connecting those compute nodes to the initial levels where the data could reach that node, you can reason about where on this hierarchy each of these things could be deployed. For instance, the product quality computer vision model and the predictive maintenance model could actually be running on a gateway right on each individual factory line. Or following a different path through the lines, they could be deployed at an AWS outpost that runs modeling for all of the uh, factory lines, so the four to five lines in that given factory. Then you can continue following that all the way up to the point where you could just build this as a lake house solution where everything runs on the cloud region. But by capturing metadata on these nodes and lines, for instance, the bandwidth of networking on a line or the um, number of CPUs or GPUs that are necessary in order to run a particular model and the number that are available on a particular piece of hardware we can start to make better informed decisions about how we can deploy this out such that we're maximizing our use of the resources available. Next, we can start to model the actions that we can take so that we have an understanding of which parts of the system we are influencing by building, building out these applications. So if we focused on the kind of the business intelligence side of this and what are the readings we're going to be able to make before, now we're starting to focus on the uh, value realization. So how do you change things such that when you have a specific reading, you do something differently to achieve value. So this gets us to that knowledge level on what's actually happening in this particular application. And we can start to understand that at all of these different layers by taking the fact that the actions make this no longer a, an acyclic graph. It in fact creates cycles. So those cycles relate to the management and optimization of specific components of the system. In this case, machine product quality. So as we have product quality challenges and we divert products, we can actually change the, um, the flow of data so that those migration readings start going to that gateway so that we can better understand whether there's a problem with some of our machines. Now that actually ends up affecting broader components of the system because if we determine a machine is bad and it needs to be taken out of service, that changes our machine uptime calculation and that machine uptime actually helps with, or actually is a major component of managing the assembly line uptime. And that's what that plant manager is tasked with doing is making sure that they manage to get the maximum output from their plant. And again, everything continues to flow up such that that production line uptime goes into the logistics management of warehouse stock versus newly produced product coming off, off of the uh, factory lines. And eventually you end up at the global level where you might even be adjusting your marketing such that if you know you're going to have a production shortfall, potentially like uh, you know, during a shock to the system like uh, COVID, you can manage down demand or adjust pricing in response. So by looking at all of these different loops and the way that they interact over time, that's how we achieve that top level of the hierarchy we we're talking before that we didn't really get to that wisdom level. And wisdom is really where a lot of the use case definitions from McKinsey live, like optimizing entire logistics networks or optimizing the systems within a car such that it can drive itself in very complex scenarios. And ultimately using those to gain value because the cars can then talk to each other and become more efficient. So obviously building this type of system is very complex, but it's much easier to understand all of the different sub problems to it by representing it as this type of directed acyclic graph and then eventually adding in the cycles and understanding how management occurs within these. So within each of these actions, you'd be able to talk about who is doing something, how are they getting the information they need? How are they checking on the additional information they'll need in order to make a decision? So moving back to where we were, the next step here is all of that complexity. Now that we can break it down into sub problems, we can start to test for each of the solutions to those sub problems and build up to our overall validation of these systems as a uh, kind of composed solution of lots of smaller problems. So there's two sides to the verification problem within this fog computing data pipeline. On the left, you have 
verifying the platform. So all of those capabilities, publish and subscribe, storing and forwarding of data, local computation models on your different hardware that's deployed out into the field. Those things can be validated maybe in a lab type scenario where you have examples of the specific gateways before you go into production and then verified as the full solution is actually deployed, not full solution, but the full platform is deployed across your, um, your infrastructure, whether that's into a factory or into a product that's actually shipping out into the field. Separately, the individual applications or combinations of data products that you're using to hit those use cases and realize value need to be tested as well. And in order to do that, you don't want to use the actual gateways because those are going to become bottlenecks in the process. So you need to build tools that can create synthetic scenarios that replicate uh, things like uh, network connectivity issues in testing environments. And those testing environments can actually be on the full cloud. If you think about the way that that graph actually led all the way back up to a cloud lake house type architecture, that's actually great for testing, given that the programming model across everything from the gateway through the uh, local zones is going to be very similar and the deployment model will be very similar to what happens on the full cloud. You can use that to your advantage to build test environments for building these types of solutions over time. Now, the, the capability to create synthetic scenarios will help in the beginning. But in addition, as you get into the deployed applications, capturing the test data sets that map to anomalous situations, things you haven't seen before, is one of the important uh, capabilities of these types of setups so that you can continue to understand the challenges that you have. You're definitely going to have to iterate over these solutions, especially the first few to build up that uh, kind of enterprise capability around building scenarios and testing rigorously something that's not necessarily deployed. Eventually, once the platform side of things is verified and the application is verified, you can use the same testing techniques as long as you were automating them on the cloud over the distributed infrastructure by simply pushing some of your test code onto the gateways and onto the local uh, cloud zones and, and edge hybrid technology. Those same tests can actually be used as some of your production monitoring then to ensure that the system is continuing to run as the data changes, as the network changes, as the status of devices change over time. Next thing you'll need to do as you build up these solutions and you can use that, uh, that DAG model of data flow to do this is understand where you can safely compress or downsample or throw away low value data. So those IoT sensors that are producing 30 Hertz data, most of the readings aren't going to be highly varied. So you may want to have always on type approaches to downsample that data or use standard compression. If the re reading is just 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, uh, standard compression will really dramatically reduce. It'll just you know, say 10 over the next 100 readings and send two numbers across instead of 100. Uh, another thing you could be doing here is forwarding only the anomalous data across. If you're using log-based storage and stream processing, you have the new capabilities to also do things like forward details only when anomalies were detected. You saw the, the line going from uh, a bad product detected to turning on forwarding on the high, you know, 30 hertz data in order to be able to save from processing that when everything seems to be running fine. The other options you have here are running the same calculations across that detailed data or that aggregated data at higher levels in the hierarchy. So using these message processing systems, you could process the data streams at an outpost or at a local cloud zone, or you could go the other direction and take the computations that are running in batch at the, or sorry, not in batch, in aggregate across many factory lines or many cars or whatever it might be, and push those down such that they're on the gateways and really tied to the factory line or running on the car itself. That unified programming model as well, uh, unified infrastructure model as well as the log-based programming model enables you to pull that off. The final opportunity, I'll call it, this one might be different than a challenge, is the ability to push things both up and down that hierarchy. So it, it's a challenge in the sense that on the cloud, you always have all of the data available. And so you don't have to worry about pushing down aggregates back to earlier stages so that they can be combined with more of that live streaming data. But in a fog hierarchy, you have the ability to send a lot less data out to the lower powered components here by taking those aggregates at the higher level and then simply using the same publish subscribe mechanism, but turning the arrows facing the other direction. A good example here might be the factory managing uptime if they know the warehouse off. If you have 50,000 of the part you're trying to make and you have a machine that might be defective, a lot easier to take that out of service and just manage 
demand through the warehouse stock versus continue going and then take a long outage because that machine breaks. And then the opportunity side of this is around this kind of federated optimization. So enabling those that are closest to the real world implementation of this, the ones that are responsible for really realizing the value and using their knowledge to derive through self-service, new calculations and metrics, new types of actions that can be taken. And then provide the capability to go you know, horizontally to other factories or other cars without having to redeploy the entire end-to-end -end solution. Good example there might be, let's say you've got a mine and you develop a new metric to predict safety hazards. Well, you can deploy that out to all similar mines if they're already instrumented with this type of fog platform. Last thing I want to talk about is if you are interested in getting started with this, if you're ex as excited about it as I am, what should you do? So I really think about it as five steps here. First one is really looking at those use cases. Uh, you know, the McKinsey use cases are only one way to start to understand how this might affect your business. Build the business case for how much value you can get out from these hot and warm type scenarios and how much of your business is distributed out into the real world. Once you've got the right set of use cases prioritized, you start to build out that graph, that directed acyclic graph, and understand the way that data is flowing and where it can be deployed onto different nodes in the fog hierarchy. That architecture step enables you to then, in parallel, build the application layer or the data pipeline layer on the cloud while also building up and configuring that MVP of the fog computing infrastructure. There's actually gonna be hardware provisioning involved here, but there's also then gonna be that testing of all the different components. Those that streams oftentimes will take similar amounts of time such that you can go validate that combined infrastructure platform and application data pipeline level together once those complete. That first one to three applications or data pipelines that are being built are gonna go out into the real world then, start to realize value, take time to learn from that so that you can then prioritize your investments in the platform layer and in other potential use cases downstream. That's really high level, but it takes a lot of the lessons we've learned from building the streaming and lake house platforms and simply adds the additional layers that are important for building out these distributed cloud or fog computing solutions. So with that, I thank you for taking the time here. And like a lot of what we're talking about in technology, the future is already here. In this case, it's just not very evenly distributed right now. Felt like that quote was perfect for this particular talk because it applies on multiple levels. With that, I'll turn it over and answer your questions. Hopefully I've answered already the key six questions that I set out to, and I'd love to hear more about what's on your mind. Thank you very much.